in three, two, one. Hello and welcome to the KD Ratio Podcast, your place for all things nerd. My name is William, and tonight I have Dylan and Kyle. Gentlemen, 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 let's jump right in. Uh, awfully bold of you to assume I'm a gentleman. Oh, oh, oh. I am a rough man. <laughs> <laughs> okay, lumberjack man. Huh? <laughs> well, what's the opposite of gentleman? Uh, oh, you're right. I, I guess literally <laughs> the opposite of gentle man would be rough, rough man. Mm-hmm. Rough woman. Oh, Ooh. that is the actual exact opposite. Well, that takes me right into my first topic. <laughs> uh, <laughs> actually, I wanted to ask you guys, because I saw this thread online, um, and I wanted to ask you guys, what is the greatest moment, moment in your gaming careers? I'll start because I've had some ch- um, some time to think about this, but I saw this thread and it was on my favorite game and it was just talking about the best moments in that game. And it got me thinking about like, what is like my all time highlight in terms of gaming? I've had a bunch, Kyle. I mean, we've done numerous LAN parties, which those are always a blast hit and so much fun to do. Um, but I think for me, my all time greatest singular moment would be when I held what was called Hall of Heroes in Guild Wars 1 for the very first time, I remember, I remember it so clear because I was, it was something that was like so difficult to do at the time when I was playing because it was like everybody was playing, millions of people were playing, and it was like the pinnacle of PvP. And you had to, it was sort of like winner take all and then loser gets bounced out. And you had, you had like up to, I think even like 16 stages to get to Hall of Heroes. So you could get bounced out at any time. You're going against other guilds and competitive teammates. And I remember we we, we finally got there. Getting to Halls is just one thing. And then, uh, you know, you have to basically win it. And you're up against two other teams. Mm-hmm. And when you win it, it posts to the entire server that your team won. And Ooh. people could go back and watch the match. And it was just like, it was a big deal. And I remember our team comp, it was that we were... Uh, it was a necro spike, and I was uh, I was a necro on the team, and I remember it was such a simple build to run, but our guild had been like really really practicing for so long, and we were so good, and we were we were doing a good job. But when we held for that first time, it was like it was literally I, I think I stood up and screamed. It was like that that important to me. Because I had worked so hard to one even get into a guild that was that competitive, which is that's a hard enough thing. But two to like achieve that in gaming, the satisfaction that I got from that, like, dude, if social media existed in that time and I was like interested in using those platforms, everybody mm-hmm. would have known about it. <laughs> it was this that satisfying to to get um, kind of like you know our first Warzone victory, you know, like. Yeah. To, to a way lesser extent, um, you know, it the was like, flood it's, of endorphins. yeah, you're just getting hit with the dopamine and you're like, wow, when I was like, you know, in ninth grade, I held halls and it was just the most incredible eight person experience. You know, I'm with all these people that I don't even know, you know, we work together to solve a goal or to, to, to achieve this goal and we did it and we held it actually a few times in a row um, before getting bumped out. But it was just such an amazing experience to to feel, um, yeah. So that was, I think, that's my single single moment, my single greatest moment in gaming. Hmm. What is? Who wants to go next? Do you have one ready, Kyle? Um, I don't actually. So I'll let you take this okay. and I'll think about it some more. So I have, I would say, um, like two, and they're pretty similar. Um. Not being one for competitive gaming, I, none of I don't have any that are related to really that. Although you know the first Warzone win feels really good, you know. <laughs> um, but mine more relates to the first game I beat on the hardest difficulty, which was Oof. Dead Space Two, and I I was you know this was before like super detailed guides. You could go on probably GameFacts dot com and look up a guide, but. Um, Otherwise, it was just like a bunch of text and you had to read through. So I didn't look up any guides and I just went into it. And 
you only have a limited number of saves. I think it's three saves. Oh my god! And so if you die, you have to go back to that save. <clears throat> no, if you die, it's permadeath. The saves are for like if you need to, you know, get off and you know go so to you, bed. <laughs> you have to one shot that game. Well, the saves are for like if you need right, to go to bed. Right, but if it's permadeath, mm-hmm. you have to one shot it. Mm-hmm. Oof. And so I was, I was so happy when I finally did it. Yeah. And made it through and i had because i played through that game a bunch of times new game plus and so i planned out where i was gonna save like i knew the points i was like okay this is about midpoint it's a good place to save and then this is near the end just in case and then it felt really good that felt really good and then the other one was um i beat last of us on the hardest difficulty which is super difficult because you there's like zero resources so it makes you get really creative which was a fun a fun like experiment to have in a game where you you know you're used to being able to find bullets to shoot people or stuff yeah. but you actually had to use the environment to like you might not kill all these people in this this uh, area you might just want to sneak through it and distract them and only kill the ones you have to necessary because if you get hit and you can't heal that kind of screws up the rest of the run so i would say those two those were my my shining moments for me um that i can think of yeah dude those are like the the achievement like when you overcome something difficult Mm -hmm. i remember like i think the first game that i ever like could say i beat was uh because i i didn't play those kinds of games like really and you know i played a lot of smash bros and like Mm -hmm. a lot of n64 games that you don't really beat you know yeah um first game i think i beat would be like ratchet and clank um, and I remember overcoming this last boss. I don't remember the name of the, the game that I was playing. It might have been the first Ratchet and Clank, but it was a circular arena. And you had to, gr- like, there was a strat that I finally figured out that you could, like, grind in this circle around the boss. And you were mobile enough to, like, avoid a lot of his AoE splash mm-hmm. stuff. But the thing about the grinding was you could get a shot off. But you had to then like reposition your camera and jump because it wasn't like just one thing that you could. Yeah, you had to kind of get onto a different rail. So, and there was like this weapon that I think he could only be damaged by, or it would take like almost infinite ammo to like beat him normally. But like you had to shoot this rocket, which then like you boarded this rocket and you guided it into him. Oh, and it took a second to fire. So like. Trying to get the timing of that down, it was so difficult. Um, and I remember just being so elated when I beat it on my PS2. I was like, this is amazing. Well, <laughs> and I'd say, you know, similar to that is I didn't really like Dark Souls games or or Bloodborne, but I had a, a moment of awakening in Sekiro when um, you fight Genichiro, I think is the guy's name. Mm. And that's all of a sudden it clicked. And I was like, ooh, I get why people like this yeah. game. And then I was able to beat him, and I was like, oh, okay, okay. And then so now, you know, now I love Elden Ring. We've talked about it a bunch, but it was the same kind of like it was difficult, and it finally it finally clicked for me on on what I, h- how to approach the problem yeah. of those enemies. So two two out of the three, we'll, we're waiting to hear from Kyle, but two out of the three are, are based around achievement. And mm-hmm. I think that that, I think that's such a core part of gaming. Yeah. You know, that. I think is is its secret sauce. Kyle, yeah. you thought of anything? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of moments where, I mean, all revolving really around like the Soul series. <laughs> like, there's a lot of moments within that um, that you know you get really elated if you spent a long time on a boss. And I didn't struggle with any bosses on Elden Ring as much as I did in the past. And I don't know if it's because Elden Ring was easier or if it's just I got better at that type of game. Um, but honestly, like one of my core memories in like gaming that like really set off like my, my love of video games, there is this game called Descent. Um, it is like a space, uh, sim combat sim where you're in a, like a fighter, uh, fight space fighter jet thing. And the idea of the game is, you know, you have to go in, complete objectives inside like an asteroid or something. And then once you do what you're supposed to do, you got to get out of there before it explodes. And I used to watch my dad play that game like for hours. 
he would play that game and I'd just be sitting there like just staring in awe. <laughs> and I thought it looked so good. And he used the joystick and everything like on PC. And so I beat that game um, before maybe like this was like 2000, 2001. So I was, I was like five or six years old. And I beat that game with some help from my dad. But when I beat that game... That was like probably the like greatest moment in gaming for me because it's what created my love of video games. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, looking back on it, I don't even know if I would put that game in like my top five, but top fifty. <laughs> yeah, but it was such a important moment for me uh, as a child because it defined it. It defined the type of game that I like, and it's like those personal, you know, like one on one type experiences, and I think that's why. I'm still into that kind of thing, like to this very day. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, do you have any honorable mentions? I mean, when I was going through and thinking about like my singular, you know, I have greatest, a bunch of honorable mentions. I mean, I, yeah. I, I go back to like original Game Boy Color and plugging in a USB cable that went to like a Game Boy Advance and trading Pokemon. Yeah. I remember doing that with like friends at school and it was like the most mind blowing experience. Like, I have their Pokemon now and they have my, you know, like it was just so <laughs> wild to do. And then I think of the memories that I had for, with friends coming over and playing Spyro and, and playing that game till way too late, you know, and, and buying the PlayStation two for the first time. And maybe the first time I beat super Mario bros three. Ooh. Uh, mm. I had the game boy version of that. Um, and I played on the game boy advance and uh that was fun because i had never i don't think i'd ever played that game up until that point um and that's that was pretty big elation beating that game (laughs) for sure and that's kind of what set my love for mario too yeah i would a bunch of them are definitely related to mass effect (laughs) like um the ending of number two good that first time i played it you know oh yeah and ryan and well the thing too that uh, half your crew die no, they the actually perfect. the only I think the only person that died was Morden. Well, yeah, that's impossible to avoid, isn't it? No, you can no. send him. Well, obviously, Mass Effect in number two. In, oh, in three, in three. Dies. Spoiler oh, okay. alert! Yeah, <laughs> and oh, you God. actually can avoid him dying in three too, but the cost is too high. Yeah, but um, that's right. You told me that. Like going into that blind and and witnessing that ending. I mean, even the ending of three was like. You know, there was a lot of hype and staying up late to beat it. And it's like, wow. You know, on that note, gaming moment, and this isn't for me personally, but uh, again, spoiler alert for a game that came out in 2003, <laughs> but in Knights of the Old Republic, when they reveal to you, like during the climax of the game, that this evil, you know, emperor of the sith that they thought was dead that you were actually him and your mind got wiped and then you just come to realization that holy shit i was the dark lord of the sith that was pretty (laughs) mind-boggling at the time that was a damn one of the best twists uh in gaming and then when you play it for a second time it's super obvious (laughs) like they drop so many hints but you just don't think that that's happening until it happens in the game did you see that they were th- going to remake that game? And they canceled it. And then it. they canceled it I like don't immediately. Talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> I was actually kind of worried from the start because I wasn't super confident in As- Aspire, I think is the name of the yeah. company. Um, and they lost like all of their like core key people. <laughs> and then they canceled the project. And I'm like, I guess it'll just never happen. <laughs> Leave it as perfection. I mean, I- can you still? Is that like a? Is it a Steam game? Can you play it by uh, Steam? I think yeah, yeah. No, you can. I bought it on Steam. Okay. Uh, have you beat it on PC? I've beat it on PC. I've beat it on Xbox, the original Xbox. I've beat it on my phone. <laughs> <I've>, <laughs> Did you download an emulator for it? Or? No, they actually Aspire, the same company that was going to do the remake. The port, they huh? released a uh, an Android port. Wow. For it. Yeah. Okay. How did? Which was your favorite platform? Oh, well, PC, because that's kind of yeah. the way it was meant to be played, yeah. was on PC. Hmm. Um, Xbox port was okay, but the it was limited because it, it, it really wasn't designed for console. It was designed as a PC game. Hmm. 
I don't think that um, that would be a game I would ever try and get someone to play now, though. I think that's one of those things you would have had to have played it in the moment to really appreciate mm-hmm. it. I have a different perspective and a different lens on it, but like, if you'd never played that game and you jump in to play it now, it probably would feel really rough. Yeah. <laughs> like, For me, that's Fallout New Vegas. Like, yeah. I'm pretty sure I booted it up to show uh, my girlfriend, and I was like, look at this game. This game's great, and it's like, looks like shit looks like shit <laughs> i was like oh yeah well you know what's funny is i uh i've been watching uh there's a content creator on youtube he's he's big time con- content creator his name's linus tech tips but watching him for like a decade um and he's been doing like these comparisons of like lcd panels and crts mm-hmm. and for some reason some magic happens on crts so crts for those that don't know are like the tube tvs yeah that we used to have there's like some magic that happens when you play those older games. It makes them look it better. It makes them look better. Like they do not, for whatever reason, it doesn't really make sense to me. And it do, they never really had a good explanation for it. But there are certain animations, certain sprites that show up and they look so much better on a CRT than they do on a tradi- on a modern display. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was playing on, it's a, interesting. on a tube TV till probably... 2014 wow <laughs> before i finally bought a monitor oh because yeah you were always on console yeah yeah I had yeah a tube tv for pretty late too yeah you're you guys had that jeez i remember when you guys bought that it was like a 55 inch tube tv or something that was well that was like the f- the the year 2000 my my family had bought a a 55 inch tube tv <laughs> the, and it was like the size of your wall because it you know 55 yeah, inches yeah. is different when it's a square versus like a 16 by 9 aspect ratio. And let me tell you that we were the a monster we were like the the talk of the town you had everyone, all the super bowls everyone was at our house to watch tv yep <laughs> like it was it sick was man deal. it was sick for sure but there's some magic and and you know they went into like they went in to talk about the history, like CRTs. When LCDs came into prominence, like LCDs were so much were so behind CRTs at the time. Like, but LCDs won because they worked good enough. They had like, uh, um, and they were cheap. They were cheap, so uh, they they won out. But like CRTs, I guess the technology was invented like over a hundred years ago. Versus LCDs have really sort of been maybe like a 60, you know, 60 year history. So like they're still getting things back. And they did this episode where they had this like $3,000 super ultra wide, just like mine in there. But it's a CRT from like the year 2000 or something. A super ultra wide CRT. Dude, it was, (laughs) you you should check this video. Look up Linus Tech Tips and do like CRT or something like that. And you'll see that you'll see it pop up. But it was a super ultra wide for ultra wide, like for desktop performance and stuff. And it, it was definitely wonky and stuff like that. But it was like, if you think about the year, it's like, holy shit. Yeah. You know? But they just did a recent video um, talking about HD CRTs that were made. So they were in like, I think 720, maybe 10. I don't know what the resolution was, but they were considered HD. And like the top of the line CRT, like in a lot of the content that they wanted to be to watch. The CRT won because the CRTs like have, there is no like, like there's no limit. I don't think to like frames per second, oh. like it, it can go as fast as you need it to go. Cause it's just electrons being thrown at the screen. Mm-hmm. And so like, they have like a lot of advantages over traditional like LCD panels and like, you know, digital monitors. Let's bring CRTs back. <laughs> I don't think we need to go there, but um <laughs> Because I think we're finally getting there with like OLED technology and stuff like that. But it's just interesting to see like how maybe just about now we're like in, in every way we're better than CRTs. Like if you buy top of the line stuff. But to like, I mean, I remember my first job, like, you know, when I had to go into like some of like the, or you get like those shitty monitors. I remember like the Dell, like I had this Dell as a kid. You know, in like 2000, it that screen sucked <laughs> compared to like, you know, any like the TV. It wasn't even mm-hmm. close. You know, I beat Mass Effect two on a a CRT. Yeah, TV, and I would four by four. It was <laughs> maybe I think it was like a 14 inch TV. Um, oh wow! 
And it was so com- compact that on the mini game, the hack one where you have to match the, uh-huh. you couldn't even really see it. And oh, I no. was just kind of going off of colors. <laughs> that kind of, <laughs> and that's how I did it. Um, that game was not designed to be played like that. But I mean, you know, when that game came out, I was. 14 mm-hmm. <laughs> so yeah i wasn't uh i wasn't pulling in the money to be able to buy something and i don't think my dad would have cared about that i need a a nice monitor for mass <laughs> effect yeah right <laughs> like uh what no <laughs> yeah. i need an ultra wide crt <laughs> and we used to play um four player split screen i remember on that. a 12 inch tv was it 12 inch yeah that was because i i, I had upgraded that. to a 15 inch star fox, but the first right? one i had was 12 inches we used to play gamecube star fox <laughs> four player split screen that was battles. pretty miserable I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> and we did that bad. for like nine hours a night <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't the greatest experience but it worked <laughs> i did back in my day <laughs> I don't remember how big my CRTV was, but I did uh, Sims 2, and me and my friend would play that for hours. One day we did like probably 12 hours. We played it straight. <laughs> yeah. So wild, man. It was split screen, and it was a, a lot smaller than our TVs are now. I honestly, come to think of it, I was playing on one probably up until PS4. Really? Yeah. In your living room? <laughs> I was, no, in my bedroom. Oh shoot! Yeah. yeah, I was playing on a CRT, uh, huh? Probably up until PS4. Like that's how late to the you, game I was. Did they? Did the PS3 have a PS3 red, yellow... still had an RCA connection? It did. Yeah, mm-hmm. RCA. I couldn't remember the name. Yeah, RC, it did, huh? Uh huh. Out yeah. of the box, or did you have to buy that? It was no, no. It was, it was um, primarily the RCA, but it was also HDMI compatible. Yeah. If you, but it had both. Um, and then it wasn't until PS4 that they went away with that totally. entirely and went straight to HDMI. Yeah. I remember when uh, I got my first, like, um, when I transitioned away from CRTV, I remember it was like my mind was blown by how clear the games were. I was like, wow, I can actually see the detail. Well, that's how I felt when I replayed the Mass Effect <laughs> series. <laughs> I was like, Jesus, I missed so much. Yeah. In fact, the first time I bought a monitor, I bought a, it was like a 35 inch monitor. Um, That's a big ass monitor. Yeah. Uh, well, actually, I don't know how big it was, but <laughs> it was a lot bigger than what I was used to. I know that. So it felt big. It probably wasn't 35 now that I, I put it into yeah, perspective. Yeah, that's for reference, 24 inches. 24. I think, honestly, I might have had that exact model. <laughs> when, that might be. I think this I think is. You mentioned that actually. I think this is actually the exact one I bought, <laughs> except at the time it was a couple hundred bucks. We bought this one for what? Fifteen? Uh, Twelve. Twelve dollars. Yeah. And then, and then subsequently spent twenty on the power cable. That because. is insane. How quickly tech devalues. <laughs> like. Yeah. But anyways, um, Will, you actually went with me. First time I bought a, a monitor, you, you were like, "I'm going with you," and we went to Best Buy. Shit. And you were like, I've been PC gaming for years. I know what you want. <laughs> and I was like, okay, you pick it out. And you picked out this monitor because oh, it, sure. was, it was convenient for uh, price, but also quality. There and we go. I think this one can go up to 1080. But Yeah. No, and it's, I mean, here we are a decade later, at least. <laughs> still, yeah. Still wow. rocking it. Damn, dude. That's some good ass memories. What I'm saddened by, uh, I don't know what you guys have done like to collect your memories if you just have them in your head but i'm saddened because like on the pc side when you like you could take screenshots and everything's saved but almost every single time i format my hard drive or upgrade my pc i forget about those screenshots and that documents folder and i never back it up and i've lost so many great moments over my gaming career a lot of uh cool videos oh man i mean Video, like all that, I mean, it's just, it's lost when you, you know, over time. But I miss, I miss having the, some of those screenshots because especially in like the PC games I've played over the years, like I, I always usually do them socially. And so I take really cool screenshots and I still have every, I have every console I've ever owned. I haven't gotten rid of any of them because I'm like too nostalgic over it. So if I wanted to, I could line them all the way up from Nintendo 64 all the way up to my PS5. And I've owned at least one from every generation. 
Wow. And it's always first gen too. So I always have like the fat models of yeah. everything. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> I've always, I, I've, I've never bought like a slim version of anything. I used to collect the instruction booklets uh, from games. I know they don't oh, make them anymore, but I would, uh, for a while, I had a, a guy that was my friend at GameStop and he would allow me to con- consistently like trade in a game. And then if I beat it before the seven days, I could take it back in, get a new game. And then just, I could keep doing that. And uh, so every time I take the instruction, I keep the instruction booklet. So I have a big stack of them, but they don't do instruction booklets anymore. How well, sad are video they games? Do a, in here's a QR anymore. code to read our instruction book online. <laughs> you know. They're so sad, dude. They feel literally empty. It's yeah. like, why am I even wasting this much plastic? My favorite of my collection is Sly Cooper, Thievius Raccoonus, because it looks like a book. And it's it you open it up and it's like has little notes in it, like Sly Cooper wrote in it. And it's just it's so immersive. But now it's like, oh scan the QR code. So, <laughs> on that same note, Knights of the Old Republic, the PC edition. When I first bought that, it had like a fat booklet in it. And not only did it tell you like what the game was about, there was a whole like uh, breakdown of the events and lore leading up to the start of the game. And then in the back, there was a description of every force power that was in the game. There, it was like, wow. I was like, Hold, the games do not guide, come like yeah. that now. No. Like you would never. And I think I might have paid like $39 for it, which it was like brand new at the time. Like that was what a brand new game like cost, at least from that store. Wow. Yeah, now you get digital downloads and oh, you want the collector's edition? Well, we'll include the soundtrack too. It's like if I can't find it on YouTube or any other <laughs> yeah, it's like, like really? Like what what value am I yeah. Oh wow, I gotta I gotta have a digital you know, soundtrack yeah. that I have to boot up I my PlayStation have... <laughs> if I wanna play. <laughs> <laughs> now I don't have to search it on YouTube. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, now, like, usually they'll give you, like, a... Co- I remember, um, God, I think it was one game. I don't remember. I, I think this happened, but I got a iTunes code to, like, download the album. I was like, really? <laughs> that makes more sense, I guess, than... I, I, I mean, don't like the digital copies. I got the soundtrack when I bought... Because I bought the, um, like, the fancy edition of uh, Witcher, and it was an actual disc. Uh which now that feels really antiquated, but I still got that disc in my car. <laughs> and every now and then I'll listen to some Witcher music. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The um, uh, Ghost of Tsushima, I got that, the digital soundtrack. I have not listened to it once. Same. It's like, <laughs> I have not. It's just inconvenient, open, right? Yeah. Like, is it a disc, a physical disc? No. What? How is it? Like, a, you... It's a file on my PlayStation. Oh, yeah. it's literally. Oh, they did you it that. You boot way. it up like oh, it's a no. game. <laughs> Are you kidding me? No. That is so. Who thought, like, that seems like a terrible implementation? You know, like, so, that's why, at least iTunes, you can, you know, use iTunes. You can play it on Apple Music, right. wherever. This is, I have to be on PlayStation <laughs> and boot it as a game. You, you know, don't like... get me wrong. Ghost, uh, Ghost of Tsushima was a, an amazing game, and I think it deserved Game of the Year. But that mm-hmm. being said, was there actually like a standout in the soundtrack? Yeah. Like, was there something that made you go, I'm going to go online and listen to that song? Yeah. Not for me. For me. No, I don't think there was anything in that game that soundtrack wise that I was like, now, I think the soundtrack complemented the scenery and complemented the emotions of the game beautifully, but it wasn't like I'm going to sit there and bop to, <laughs> like, you know. Do you do that with Elden Ring's music? No. Me neither. It's all, like, boss songs, right? Yeah, like, no, it's... I don't it's enjoy listening to Great music. You know, great Sights music. anxiety. <laughs> great music in Elden Ring, but it wasn't anything in Elden Ring that was like, I'm going to go listen to that song now. Yeah, it's married to the content, right? And you can't... I can't separate yeah. I can't separate the concept from the song. A uh, game that I can do that with um is Mass Effect. I mm. love listening to the soundtracks in Mass Effect. M4 Part 2. Yeah. Love that song. And I can also do that with Cyberpunk. Cyberpunk has some really good music in it. Do you like the well the oh, what's the name of it? The pop pop pop. It's the it's Oh, the one that you you see everywhere? Yeah, the little... I know what one you're talking about. <laughs> the, in the Cyberpunk? girl band? No, I, I mean, I'm I'm talking specifically about like... Soundtrack? The, the scores, not, oh. the li- not the licensed music. 
I, in fact, I don't even really know if I've ever listened to the licensed music in Cyberpunk. Not on the car radio? Are no, I always turn the radio off wow. when I'm when I'm driving around. That distracts me. You know, Focus. when I'm playing a game, I I don't want to listen to like the radio. <laughs> I always turn it off in GTA also. Really? Yeah. What? Oh my god, I love the music. <laughs> yeah. If anything, that immediately immerses me more. Mm-hmm. Especially when you hear like the news reports and it's like referencing something you did, or you're like, ooh. Well, sometimes in Cyberpunk specifically, if you turn off the radio when you're driving, it plays like an ambient soundtrack. Oh, okay. I, I APB like- Reloaded um, had my favorite band in it at the time, Phoenix, and they had this their 1901 song, which is my favorite song by them. And in that game, you could customize your playlist, which I think you probably do in a lot of games, but I made it only that song. So every time I got into a car, that song queued off and just replayed. And it was like, <laughs> it was so good because it was like, all right, banger. Here we you go. You know what game series that I go fully into the licensed music? is tony hawk's pro skater <laughs> oh god <laughs> that game not known for its soundtrack those games yeah they are <laughs> within the community yeah. not like you know <laughs> the, the masses and the oscar goes to <laughs> greatest soundtrack <laughs> um a lot of the bands that i discovered as a kid was from tony hawk games <laughs> like huh. uh they have a lot of good ones hmm that's interesting. Oh, I thought I thought you liked the actual score. <laughs> no, I'm I don't even know if it even has a score. I think it's all just licensed music. It's not like there's intense battle themes when you're trying to collect skate. <laughs> yeah, usually after a long after a, a long time, I usually turn off music in games because it just annoys me. I'd rather listen to my own music. I have to have yeah. something in the background. Certain games, yeah. I'll do that. Like I did that with Destiny. Um, when I really started to play it, because I just Spotify. I, I wanted to Spotify rather than listen to the score. Yeah. L- Elden Ring, I beat six times in a row without I, on complete mute and listen to a single noise. <laughs> wow. When I was speedrunning it to try and get to New Game Plus. I don't think I could do that. I don't, I don't like listening to outside <laughs> music. when I, That'd be tough for me because so much of what I like about um, games is like the score well that, i mean i already that completely changes a battle for me i had already put in like 150 hours or 120 hours or whatever it was and beat it twice legit and then i was like okay i need to get the new game up plus eight here we go <laughs> you know Mute. what um <laughs> and then grind <laughs> you know what is cool about cyberpunk is um if you use the spotify i don't know if this works on all platforms but if you use the spotify app on play playstation 5 and you're listening to music, then all of the in-game music in Cyberpunk um, automatically mutes itself. So you don't have to go in and turn it down or anything. Huh. That's yeah. pretty cool. Hmm. At least I think so. Because <laughs> I've done that before, and um, it completely, like the other stuff, completely muted out the score and the soundtrack. Hmm. Interesting. Huh. Well, gentlemen... I know, I know you wanted to bring up a Lilo and Stitch. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> when you say it like that, it's <laughs> this is an important topic. It's Dylan, very take us important home. to my heart. I'm hurt. Oh, is it? No. Did you grow up with Lilo and Stitch? I love Lilo and Stitch. Really? Oh, it was yeah. never. I oh, was never I a Disney kid. Family. I was. I was never a Disney kid. I was all Nickelodeon. Wow. I was all late night Bill Cosby show. <laughs> all right. <laughs> <laughs> great choice. Didn't age poorly. <laughs> it was a great choice at the time. Yep, it was. Not uh, Little Bill. Remember that show? Yeah, I guess we could <laughs> maybe still appreciate the art. I don't know. Maybe. I don't know. But anyways, um, so I wanted to talk about uh, live action remakes and what our thoughts on our, are on them because they just announced the Lilo and Stitch live action remake. And I hate it. I hate Lion King was worse it was in my opinion it was they ruined the movie and i just don't like it i don't get why come up with a new idea i want to watch a new movie rather than a remake of these old ones you thought they ruined the movie lion king i think they did i think the the animated is leagues above same with mulan i think the animated movie is leagues above with mulan i'm with you with Lion King, I think there was just moments that weren't as good, but it wasn't the whole movie. 
I thought it was an interesting, like, artistic creation. Like, it was really well done. And I can appreciate that. I, um, but I still like the original. I better. think, for me, it's not necessarily the live action, and it's more they're choosing the wrong ones. Yeah, like, be- exactly. So that's that's a big reason I didn't like Lion King, is because... It's already an amazing it's, movie. Well, it's an amazing movie, and then a live action, the point of it is to see real like that's still and animated stitch is not real well okay but the uh, people around him are real you know so it kind of right. makes sense whereas lion king there's not a human in that film there's right. all animated cgi creatures right. so i it didn't i was already had a grudge against it for that but it's like the the only um live action remakes i like that they've made i did like jungle book and then um aladdin was pretty good Aladdin, I wasn't a huge fan. No? No, I don't know. It didn't capture nearly the same magic. No. As the I don't think Robin it did, Williams. but I didn't think it was as, as bad yeah. as Mulan. No, They need to I, do like a live action remake of like Hey Arnold <laughs> or something. You know, <laughs> something Nickelodeon. That you can, something that you can actually, I totally agree with you. Like if you're going to have like non-earthly beings, something that is completely like you only create an animation. Mm-hmm. You know, and then like, why are you gonna superimpose like a natural world, but then still have CGI? Like, it's just super weird. It's a super weird concept to me. That's why Lilo and Stitch. I guess it makes sense because you know it's in Hawaii, which is beautiful, and then the only CGI is the aliens. Otherwise, but I'm also with cast. you on the whole like. Yeah, but Stitch. Why can't we have new stories? Exactly. And why do we need to rehash the same thing over and over again? Dude, because remakes pay a shitload of money, and it doesn't take sometimes. Any, you know it. You know it's gonna hit. Like soon, you hit on that nostalgia. Let's be honest. Disney is broke. You heard it <laughs> here first. They need the money. <laughs> yeah. You know what? What movie I would like to see made into live action because I think it lends itself well is Treasure Planet. Treasure Planet. Do you think they would touch that one though? Because it it didn't do good, right? What's Treasure Planet? It didn't. Well, that's maybe why. It, People would be okay with you. Never saw Treasure Planet. I'm trying to remember. It's like it's... Treasure Island, but in space. <laughs> yeah, I loved that. It's movie. It's so good. I loved it. Oh God, yeah, yeah, I know this movie. Yep. See, I'm not a Disney guy, man. See, that one would almost be. It'd be like we're watching Pirates of the Caribbean. Yeah. In space. In space. How fantastic would that be to see a, you know, a giant sail ship, flying through space? <laughs> I'd be all for that. Yeah. But, you know, maybe they wouldn't because that was a critical... Well, it wasn't a critical flop, but it was a box office flop. Mm -hmm. It's like a cult following film. Yeah. What about if they made Hercules into live action? They are. It's called Marvel. (laughs) That is technically Disney, too. The Disney Hercules. Marvel is Disney. The, The Disney animated film Hercules. That's what they're doing with Thor 17. <laughs> Thor 17 is coming out with. I, I liked Hercules a lot. I know it has my favorite song, my favorite Disney song in it. It's uh, I Can Go the Distance. Ah, Love that one. It is good. I That one I might be okay with because, again, it's mostly human things. I mean, well, of course, he's a god, whatever. But it's like you have a human main character and it there's... Only a few things you'd have to CGI. What about Emperor's New Groove? That one would be. That one might work too. David Spade the still plays the yeah, the emperor. He Mulan would have Disco. to, you know. Mulan should have worked, but they just decided they wanted to change the story. Mulan... I refused to watch it because it was thirty dollars. Yeah. Yeah. Not anymore. But is it free now? It's free now. Yeah. Uh-huh. Mulan had all of the like ingredients to make mm-hmm. an amazing recipe it's a really good story um it has like some of the most iconic like songs, songs. um and it can be an epic like martial art film mm-hmm. you know and like they i think it just missed it it like got 70 percent on all categories across the board which made it overall just kind of miss everything yeah, me. I mean, for me, it was a lot of decisions that they made that already put me in a bad mood. 
like going into it yeah. like um mushu right you know the dragon that we all grew up loving uh they said he wasn't in the film because they wanted to make it a more realistic version they're they just, have a witch that yeah. turns into a falcon and it's like their justification is it wasn't a remake of the cartoon it was a movie about the story and it's like so they're like you have to separate the cartoon from this movie because it's not the same thing yeah it's called but, mulan yeah and they well that's because the, the, the mulan is based on the story of mulan it's same source material but different directions but yet they reference the song in the film which one the um i'll make a man out of you and the i will bring honor to us all yeah dude i love the i'll make a man out of you it's um, just a good song. movie mm-hmm. i still get the chills when she's like about to get kicked out of the army and then she climbs up that pole <laughs> i don't know why but it i'm always like it the gives grit, me goosebumps you know? yeah the grit <laughs> like, and determination well and then ooh, you're about to get me on a rant on this so the special Dylan thing on rants grab your popcorn yes the special thing about mulan in the animated film was that she was just you know, she was determined to do it, right? She didn't have magic. She was just good. There was no cop-out. She just became a good martial artist. In the movie, she has chi. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, what the... F- why? And so it changes the whole message of the film that only special girls have chi. And it's like, whereas before it was, you know, well, they, any girl it, can They be made an effort to kind of move forward like the feminist movement without realizing that they're actually setting it back. Yeah. You know, because she proved that she could do anything a man, a man could do. do. And she proved that she could do most of them even better purely because of how determined she was to prove herself. Mm-hmm. Here it was like, oh, the only reason that you can <laughs> succeed is because, you know, you're a witch. <laughs> like, <Yeah. laughs> you know, and that's what it felt like. Uh, maybe I'm I'm missing the mark on that, and I'm not one to speak for the feminist movement at all. But <laughs> <laughs> I agree with you, Kyle. Though I just I felt like it ruined the message of the film, and that I hate that movie. Damn, that's some hard hitting shit. Yeah. I don't hate it as much as you do, but I understand where you're coming from. Hmm. Well, you know, last time we talked about space. Yes, the final frontier. The final frontier. I wanted to get your guys' opinion. Is it the final frontier? Let's get uh, let's put the thinking caps on for a second here. I mean, I guess it depends on the category. But yes, I, I would say it's the final frontier. <laughs> or is anal. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it's a whole frontier, but... Um, a whole frontier? Yeah. I would call that a whole rear tier. <laughs> Oh, my God. Way to tank this segment, guys. I appreciate you all. <laughs> Let's reel it back. I, yeah. I'm in, I am interested. I'm putting on my thinking cap. And you got it on? I got it on. I, I think you put on your dirty cap there for a second. <laughs> for a second, yes. <laughs> okay, thinking cap's on. Time. It's time travel. The concept of time. It being sort of linked with gravity, as we understand it, with the spa- like special relativity. My question is... Do you guys ever think we'll be able to manipulate time as we understand it? As like, you know, as we understand it, an arrow of time, you ever think we'll be able to play with that? Or are we fundamentally four-dimensional beings? Do you mean like, because I I think we'll be able to manipulate it in a way that is... Do you think we'll be able to go back in time or jump to the Mm. future? Because if we if we're able to travel faster than the speed of light, we're gonna time travel. Um, but that definitely but just breaks you know relativity. Yeah, you aren't travel. It's not like you're traveling back in time. Time is just moving slower for you than everybody else. So, I I think. But going, I, we'd have to get really far in our civilization to be able to utilize time. It's coming out tomorrow. <laughs> I, think that, I think that we could do some wonky things with time based on our current understanding of it. Like if we figure out ways to manipulate gravity, create massive machines, you know, and I'm talking, this is not something that we are even 
close to being able to do now. Um, but in theory, you know, I suppose if you can create something as big as a, you know, sun, <laughs> then that is something man-made, quote unquote, that could warp, uh, you know, warp reality or warp time. But it would be, it wouldn't be like anything that would, like this machine was designed to go back in time. You know what I mean? I, I don't know how that works without breaking several laws that are currently in place. Well, and that the whole thing about time travel is if it exists, shouldn't we already know? Right. Shouldn't somebody have come back? That would be my counter argument to traditional time travel thinking is that if we do at one point have it, wouldn't we always have had it? Right? Yeah. I mean, like, wouldn't, wouldn't so if it was became available to any like because that's how technology is right like first the government part harnesses it and then it ends up in your pocket sort of thing right like every it's accessible to everybody wouldn't somebody want to come to this day and age and be like hey everybody here's time travel and here's the machine and yeah you can't you know, tell me that they're that careful yeah that you know one it, dude didn't wasn't like i'm gonna pretend to it be takes a, me to a the rules a <laughs> yeah. funny scene in um you probably know I'm talking about Will, but it's actually in Big Bang Theory where they're all sitting on the couch and they're like, okay, so we're all agreed. If any one of us invents time travel, we're going to come back to this moment right here. And then they all stare at it yeah. for like five seconds and then he leans back and he's like, well, that's disappointing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just one of those, I think it's just a hard law that like if you if you ever were to like, let's just say blip into existence here and, you know, and then... There's just no way it goes unknown, or they're that careful, like you said. Mm. Um, it's just interesting to, to to sort of think about. But I think you would have to do something like, you know, go faster than the speed of light. Um, but that's not possible with the current. Well, but it, like even if you did, like Dylan said, like it just slows down for you. You're not necessarily like. That's the same thing that happens with any kind of gravity that manipulates time as far as, you know, you're not time traveling. It's just moving at a different rate for you. So you can't go back in time to fix a problem right. or anything like that. You can go and like in the movie Interstellar, like you can go sit on the sidelines, you know, and mm -hmm. like have time surpass you or be younger. Like, um, you know, like Matthew McConaughey is young and then he goes back to the ship and it's like, it's been 24 years. Yeah. But as far as I'm going to go back in my own. Right. I mean, and also that movie also does touch on some theories around the, you know, the, the, what's it called at the end? Black holes. Um, no, the dimension he's in. Uh, oh, the fifth dimension? It, the, they touch on being able to potentially manipulate, uh, manipulate events in your past. You know, and, but strings. that got really like uh, theoretical at the end there. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Well, it's basically <laughs> like they just said, well, we don't know what's in black holes, so let's make it this, you know, and you become yeah. like this, you know, six dimensional being. The whole where... thing was based on a concept by Kip Thorne, but it wasn't based on any kind of actual, you know, realities that have been proven or anything like that. You think the technology is. Let me ask you guys this. Do you think technology has outpaced our wisdom as a species? For this moment, yes. You don't think we've matured enough or evolved enough to Not handle the technologies media. that we have? <laughs> Not for social media. Really? You think social media is representative of... of I think that specific I would say aspect. the atom bomb. The atom bomb, yes. But also, I, I think as far as like just public discourse i don't think we have that figured out well enough to have something that allows us to talk to every single person in the world yet you think it'll be our downfall mm, i hope not <laughs> well what well yeah i know you hope not so i don't think anyone hopes that it is but do you think it's gonna i don't know last week dylan got pretty excited at the idea of aliens coming in and destroying us <laughs> he was <laughs> yes. smiling when he yeah, said he it. was smiling i remember that so I, I don't mean, know. It, to me, the scariest thing that exists today is the is nuclear weapons. Because yeah. like for the first time on our in our planet's entire history, we 
wield the power to destroy everything. Mm -hmm. Like, as we know it, destroy everything hundreds of times over. Artificial Um, intelligence is pretty scary, too. Yeah, but it's not even close to anything that's even fearful. No, it's not. But we're so miles off. That that. coupled with, you know, a few other things. Like, there's that story where how um, uh, Facebook they developed um there's two ais that they developed to help like moderate and you know like i think that the, i think the primary purpose was like so they could filter through like inappropriate images and things like that and then they developed a language that only them understand the two ais and then they freaked out and like cut it <laughs> and they're like we'll keep them as humans for now <laughs> to to moderate that that is odd. Do I think that they're going to go and you know get our nuclear launch codes and <laughs> launch it? No, absolutely not. But uh, while it's in its infancy, it's it's interesting and it's fun. AI can potentially be a very scary thing if not done correctly, and that coupled with nuclear weapons and everything being on you know everything is computerized now. Um, if it really felt a need for us to not be around, it'd be very easy for that to happen. That's hundred hundred years off. Yeah, that's like for me, like AI is definitely a real problem. Um, but not. And I think it's an inevitable problem. But I don't believe like we are so far away from like being able to recreate a human brain. Like right now, the the stuff that I've seen being done in AI isn't isn't even that amazing it's like it's just if then statements and it can handle large large data sets and it just like you know i love watching it it's definitely amazing in what it can do but it's very like rigid in what it can do Mm -hmm. um it's not it's not really creative the stuff on chess is probably the stuff that blows me the furthest away but that's like a, a set game with set rules like life doesn't have necessarily set rules it's like uh war games I, I'm not as <laughs> impressed by uh, something that's designed specifically for one thing so much as something that is able to adapt and change given outside stimuli and stuff. I watched this uh, documentary about uh, Zero or something. I can't remember the name of uh, of Google's AI that they developed. Um but they created this platform. I should know that the name of this AI, but they created this 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 AI that was so good at chess, but it created it was so unique because what it was different was before they were giving data sets into this AI and then that AI just used the data set. But with this particular AI, they just t- taught it to learn how to learn Alpha chess. Alpha Zero. Alpha Zero, thank you. And Very quickly, like within 24 hours, it was like it had played like 60 million games of chess, whatever, and was considered like the greatest chess player of all time. But what was interesting is when they had this thing active and it was actively training and learning, it did something very unique. It had a creative solution um, versus like some of the older traditional models where they just feed in, you know, moves and data sets and here's all the winning games. Because they, uh, grandmasters sat there and studied sort of the games that they did and they saw they saw like one of the first creative solutions by the ai which was they the ai like sacrificed some of its pieces to then gain an advantage and it was Hmm. like this creative solution that none of the other models had had a chance to create and it was like i just this documentary really highlighted the fact like it was like whole it was like a holy shit moment like whoa so with that ai in particular um it taught itself how to play chess in four hours. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? So it, it had no knowledge of chess, um, but it was a program that was able to, you could feed it information and it could teach itself uh, about said information. And so they just threw... They gave it goals. Yeah. yeah. They gave it goals, be the best chess master possible. And it studied basically everything that it possibly could in four hours, which for a computer is immense. <laughs> and then it was able to beat, uh, I forget which champion it beat, but it, it did beat... Yeah, it was like the because Alpha Zero is the newest one, but then there was one that was before it. I don't remember the the name of that one, but I think maybe Alpha Zero might have been, and then the new one is like Mu Zero or something like that. Oh God, they have a yeah. newest one. I think yeah. Well, what was interesting was <laughs> like no no human could beat the old model, mm-hmm. and then this Alpha Zero came in and beat that model 
100 games to zero. It was like so much better at chess, and it was like, how far, far can we take this? You know, Absolutely I want to say crazy. it was computing. It was something insane. Like, I don't have the number off the top of my head, but it was like half a million moves in advance. It had something ready to go. Wow. <laughs> like it was predicting it was that like many simulating that many. It was simulating that many. It had, it had a response for every possible move, and then also. If that move was made, it had a response for 40 moves after that. And then if that was done, 40 moves. Like, it was just, it had endless trees. <laughs> it had already beat you before you yeah. started. <laughs> like, it found every winning solution for given your move set. That's crazy. Yeah, that's insane. It's just, it, it's just crazy to think, like, you know. So, anyway, going back to, like, what the problems are. I think, like, you know, nuclear weapons are, are crazy. How can you not be scared? By yeah, that? and I it's mean. it's wild like that we've been so calm, like no one's really used like do you remember nuclear weapons since the sixties? Well, do you remember right before COVID tested, happened? But... Right before COVID happened, we were on the verge of World War Three with nuclear we- yeah. weapons, and that was a big thing. And with then a who? month later, with, COVID with who? With Russia. We, yeah, we were. Yeah, dear. It was right. It was right after the killer killer bees. <laughs> what were we pressuring Russia on? It was a lot of the border stuff that's been going on with them in re- Ukraine, and um, was it Russia? God, now I'm misquoting. I thought it was, it was the trade year, wars with China. It was two years ago now, maybe. It was, but there was all this like talk of like, oh, nuclear wars uh, is happening. I thought maybe that was involved with like the trade war with China, which yeah. I don't know. I don't remember it being. Well, yeah, you know, I, I don't want to get too political or anything like that. Well, but, yeah, no, I don't. Think but that was definitely. Am I crazy? That was definitely something that was. No, yeah, and even with Ukraine, when uh, Russia threatened, you know, I think that's what I'm if, blending uh, that too. NATO got involved, which we are a part of. Oh, I remember that. Yeah. Um. Then they would, you know, and so that was even recently we've had kind of like threats of nuclear war, or not threats, but kind of and it's scary because it's like it's the first time that we have the power to wipe ourselves off the face of this earth overnight mm-hmm. essentially um and it's a reactive process and what's interesting is like you know we developed this technology and then we sort of agreed to not use it and it's gone phenomenally well like we've had countless wars since then in multiple countries and probably countries we don't even know about possess this ability and you know it's like we we've been extremely peaceful and so like i feel like that definitely we've expanded beyond our own wisdom but the evidence suggests otherwise right Mm -hmm. because we haven't like we haven't used them on ourselves um it's really just it's really wild but you know you bring up like technology and social media that's such a, a transformational event too. I mean, you think about 15 years ago, no one was spending time on their phones. They were maybe using TV and stuff like that. But you look at it now, like there's people out there regularly using their phones five, six hours a, a day. Mm-hmm. I think I use my phone, I think the stats show like a little over two hours a day. That's a huge amount of my free time Just to be sucked phone. into these platforms, to be, you know... Playing something, watching something. You know, that's screen you could be on putting time. putting that back into the podcast. Yeah, what the hell am I doing? <laughs> yeah, what is happening here? <laughs> but I think we, you know, I think, I, th- I think we have these technologies that advance forward. The question is, are we smart enough to, you know, use them? Mm-hmm. And are we smart enough to learn from them? And I think it just goes with time. I think. For the whole populace? Or, I mean... Let's be real here. Yeah, as a species, <laughs> yeah, can we handle species. these tools? Can we use these tools appropriately? Right? Like, yeah, we've had. Are a hammer. we currently using them appropriately? Uh, I think. I think. Yeah, I think so. I think that we're in a learning curve right now. Like, you could point to like tools like a hammer, right? Like, yeah, a hammer is a great invention. You can slam in nails, but sometimes it gets used as a murder weapon. Back when it was first invented, people were hammering their fingers and they're like uh, uh, this is a terrible uh, idea you know but like i think we're in that back sort in of... my day we used to punch nails into the wall <laughs> yeah we used our tongue <laughs> tongue <laughs> but i think like we're in that learning phase with technology and there's going to be some maturity that occurs during that you're definitely an optimist sir mm-hmm. and i appreciate that yes 
Always have been. Always have been because all I have is the evidence around me, right? Which is why is there rules? Why is there law? Why is, you know, people overwhelmingly friendly when they don't necessarily have to be? Like, you know, friendly as in they don't bother me. You know, they don't threaten me. They don't try to steal my shit, you know, screw up my shit. Like, it's, uh, you know, you and I, we didn't grow up in the best neighborhood. You know, we we didn't, and we never really had any issues with it. You know, and, and I, I think I saw plenty of examples where people were awesome. So I've always been an optimist because I feel like the evidence around us is overwhelmingly, you know, an example of that everything is on the balance of good in a in an extreme way. It's just unfortunate that, especially with these platforms nowadays, that the one or two bad things that occur get thrown in 50 million people's face mm-hmm. and reminded of, you know, how how the world, how people can suck sometimes. I just watched this video today in San Francisco. This 84-year-old dude was just walking down the street, and this kid just ran up to him full speed and tackled him, and the guy died. He didn't even rob him. He just ran away. He just wow. tackled him. Just probably and for an 84 year old guy died. Isn't that weird? That makes me yeah. like actually sick. It does. <laughs> My stomach. Yeah, I saw that. I saw. What's wrong with people? I know, but you can get you can get you can get so caught up in watching that kind of stuff, and I think that's part of the mat- maturation. Mm-hmm. That's part of the learning curve that we have to be like, you know, these platforms can be dangerous if used. And just like any tool, they could be used in the wrong way. But what's the alternative? Not having things like the internet. The internet has produced so much good, produced a lot of bad, but way too much good. Mm-hmm. Think about knowledge. You may, like think about knowledge. Like back in the day, you had if you didn't own an encyclopedia, you didn't have access to knowledge, right? Yep. I mean, how did you did you go to the public library? You had to go to a place. Yeah. Now you have the access That's exactly at the, what you did at your fingertips. <laughs> Every all the information you could get was at the library. That's and insane or school. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So um, now you've got like kids who... You people know. would kill for the internet uh, oh. in the 80s. And obviously every era leading up to that. Um, imagine how much like we take it for granted. Just the p- sheer amount of knowledge we have accessible to us at all times. For instance... About three times during this podcast, you couldn't remember something. I Googled it and found the answer in like five seconds. Yeah. I'm like, yeah. oh yeah, it was called this. I, I blame the internet for my bad memory because I know I, I know in my head, it's I don't readily have to accessible. Store it. Mm-hmm. I know the why of it and I know what it did or whatever, and then I can find it. You know, I don't have to go, I got to latch onto this for whatever. No. You know, three keywords in Google and I'll find it. You know, pretty amazing. Life is a trial. With many ups and downs. Hit me. And the more good you do, the better a man you become. Kingdom come deliverance. I thought you were going <laughs> to quote uh, <laughs> Jurassic Park with life uh, finds a way. Life finds a way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> thought that was going to go different. I did quote something, but and it actually was a much... It was a poorer quote than it actually was in the game. <laughs> I, I think I botched it a little bit. <laughs> it sounded badass to me. I love it. I think we should end on that. End on that? Gentlemen, it's been a pleasure. Yes. Dylan, where can they find us? They can find us on YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, and then all your favorite uh, podcast platforms under Katie Ratio Podcast, where we post our new episodes on the podcast platforms, and then we make memes and... Other episode updates on Twitter and Instagram. And then we also upload videos on YouTube of our sound right now. We are working on getting up and streaming here in the future. Yeah, coming soon. So keep an eye on that. We would love to chat with you guys live. Yeah. And see what your thoughts on our crazy ideas are. Absolutely. And thanks for the folks that have been reaching out and commenting and and just getting interactive with us. So we appreciate that. We do read of all and... Um, we appreciate each and every one of you taking out time out of your busy days and busy lives from the internet and all the good stuff from <laughs> it, um, and supporting our content and listening. And, uh, with that, remember with a good KD, you get the dub. Bye guys. Bye guys. Bye.